Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter of 2024. Welcome to the reading of lesson number two of the Sabbath School lessons on the book of Mark, titled, A Day in the Ministry of Jesus. It's ready for teaching on July 6. The author is Dr. Thomas R. Shepherd of Andrews University, and your reader today is Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, July 6. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come today to begin the reading of the book of Mark. As we look at a day in the ministry of Jesus, may we catch a glimpse of his life his mission, and his way of reacting with people around him. We pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us as we open your word. And today I'd particularly like to pray for those living in Middle Eastern countries who are listening to the reading of these lessons, and to the people who live in the islands of the Pacific and the Atlantic and the Indian Oceans. Lord, wherever we're listening, we just pray that your Spirit will guide us. And particularly today, I'd like to pray for Celine Chenisakoku and her children and Patricia Blagrave and her family and Perla Caraveo and her health and Irma Joseph and Hilda Santos and their families, and Jennifer T. Robinson. Lord, people have asked for prayer, and I pray that you will fulfill their needs. Each of us has a need, and this week, may not only our needs be fulfilled, but may our hearts be gladdened as we open your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, memory text for this week is Mark chapter 1 and verse 17. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And here is a friend of mine, Melanie, reading the memory verse for you again. I'm Melanie from Harvey Bay, and our memory verse is from Mark chapter 1, verse 17. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Mark chapter 1, verse 17. Each gospel introduces the beginning of Jesus' ministry in a particular way. Matthew presents Jesus as calling disciples and then preaching the Sermon on the Mount. Luke tells the story of Jesus' inaugural sermon on a Sabbath in the synagogue in Nazareth. John recounts the calling of some of the early disciples and the wedding at Cana where Jesus performs his first sign. The Gospel of Mark recounts the calling of four disciples and describes a Sabbath in Capernaum and what followed. This Sabbath with Jesus at the beginning of Mark gives the reader a sense of who Jesus is. In the entire section for this week's lesson, there are very few of his words recorded. A brief call to discipleship, a command to a demon, a plan to visit other locations, and the healing of a leper with instructions to show himself before a priest to be clean. The emphasis is on action, particularly healing people. The Gospel writer likes to use the word immediately to illustrate the fast action movement of Jesus' ministry. Sunday, July 7, follow me. Read Mark chapter 1, verses 16 to 20. Who were the men Jesus called his disciples, and what was their response? Mark 1, beginning at verse 16. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Mark 1 does not have many of Jesus' words recorded. However, Mark 1.17 does have his words to two fishermen, Simon, who will later be called Peter, and his brother Andrew. 
The two men are standing on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, casting a net. There is no mention of a boat or other fishing paraphernalia, which may suggest that the two men are not well off financially. In Mark 1, 19 and 20, James and John are in a boat with their father and servants, which suggests that they were better off financially than Peter and Andrew. Luke indicates that Peter does have a boat and that, in fact, James and John were partners of Peter and Andrew. Let's read that, beginning in Luke chapter 5, verse 1. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to pull out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signalled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken, and so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. But the Gospel of Mark may be presenting a contrast between the two sets of brothers, and in order to illustrate that difference, Jesus calls to discipleship both those who have less resources and those with more. Jesus' call to these men is simple, direct, and prophetic. He calls them to follow him, that is, to become his disciples. He indicates that if they will respond to his call, he will take on the task of making them fishers of men. Ponder why these men would immediately leave everything and follow Jesus, as we read in Mark 1, verses 16 to 20. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The Gospel of John fills in the picture more fully, as you read in John one twenty nine to 42 The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look! the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I am baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave his testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him, and I myself did not know him. But the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, The one on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen, and I testify, that this is God's chosen one. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he said, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. 
It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who would follow Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which, when translated, is Peter. It seems that the brothers were followers of John the Baptist and heard his proclamation that Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world in John 1.29. They met Jesus and spent time with him near the Jordan River. Consequently, their acceptance of Jesus' call to ministry was not some lark or escapade. They had thought this through. But why does Mark not fill in more details? Likely it is to emphasise the power of Jesus. He calls, and willing fishermen answer, and their lives and the world itself are never the same. So, to finish the day, what have you been called to give up in order to follow Jesus? Think about the implications of your answer, especially if you can't think of anything. Monday, July 8, An Unforgettable Worship Service Read Mark chapter 1, verses 21 to 28. What unforgettable experience happened in the Capernaum Synagogue and what spiritual truths can we take from this account? Mark 1, beginning at verse 21. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching? And with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. Most Christians have some unforgettable moments in their Christian walk. The decision to follow Jesus, the day of their baptism, a powerful sermon during which they deeply felt the presence of God. Some of these moments might not only be unforgettable, but be life-changing as well. So it might have been for some people in Capernaum on the Sabbath described in Mark 1. And they were astonished at his teaching, it says in verse 22, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. As Jesus was teaching, a demon-possessed man, no doubt impacted by the power of Jesus' teaching, shouted, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus cast out the demon. Think of the implications of these words from the demon. First, the demon recognises Jesus as the Holy One of God. He acknowledges that Jesus is the Holy Emissary of God, in contrast to the unclean, unholy hosts of Satan. In a worship setting, one expects holy things and individuals, not unholy and unclean things. Thus, in this story, there is a sharp contrast between the forces of good and the forces of evil. We can see here the reality of the great controversy. People might not yet know who Jesus is, but the demon certainly does, and publicly acknowledges it as well. Next, the command to come out of the man is understandable. But why the command, be quiet? Beginning here in Mark, a remarkable motif appears. Jesus' call for silence regarding who he is. 
Scholars call this the messianic secret. Jesus' call for silence makes good sense because of the political overtones of messianic expectations in his time. It was risky to be a messiah. Yet, mixed with the calls for silence are the unmistakable revelations of who Jesus is. What will become clear over time is that Jesus' identity cannot be hidden, and the truth of who he is becomes the centre of the gospel message. People need not only to know who Jesus is, but then to make a decision about how they will respond to his coming and what it means for them. So, to finish the day, in seeking to witness to others, when might it be prudent not to present all that we believe regarding present truth? Tuesday, July 9, More Sabbath Ministry Read Mark chapter 1, verses 29 to 34. How did Jesus help Peter's family? And what spiritual lessons can we draw from this account? Mark 1, beginning at verse 29. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak, because... They knew who he was. After the amazing synagogue service, Jesus retires with his small band of disciples, Peter, Andrew, James and John, to Peter's home, evidently to spend the rest of the Sabbath day in a friendly meal and fellowship. But a note of concern overspreads the scene. Peter's mother-in-law is ill with a fever which meant back then you either got better or died. They tell Jesus of the sickness, and he takes Peter's mother-in-law by the hand and raises her up. She immediately begins to serve their needs. What a powerful example of the principle that those who have been saved, healed by Jesus, will minister to others as a result. Throughout Mark, it is often the case that Jesus heals by touching the affected person. As we read in Mark chapter 1, verse 41, Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And chapter 5, verse 41, he took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kuma, which means little girl. I say to you, get up. Though other times, no touch is mentioned. As you read in Mark 2, verses 1 to 12. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralysed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowering the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralysed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralysed man, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Get up, take your mat and walk? But I want you to know, that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. 
So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. And Mark chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. Another time Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with a shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and, deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. And then in chapter 5, beginning at verse 7, he shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding in the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, Send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about two thousand in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Jesus was not done with ministry that day. After sunset, many came to Peter's house for healing, no doubt from seeing what happened at the synagogue that day or from hearing about it. The fact that the Gospel writer does not tell his readers that people delayed because of the hours of the Sabbath indicates that he expected his readers to know about the Sabbath. This feature of Mark is consistent with his readers being Sabbath keepers. Mark says that the entire city was gathered at the door that evening, in verse 33. It would have taken some time for Jesus to help all those people. We read in The Desire of Ages, on page 259, Hour after hour they came and went, for none could know whether tomorrow would find the healer still among them. Never before had Capernaum witnessed a day like this. The air was filled with the voice of triumph and shouts of deliverance. The Saviour was joyful in the joy he had awakened. As he witnessed the sufferings of those who had come to him, his heart was stirred with sympathy, and he rejoiced in his power to restore them to health and happiness. Not until the last sufferer had been relieved did Jesus seek his work. It was far into the night when the multitude departed, and silence settled down upon the home of Simon. The long, exciting day was past, and Jesus sought rest. But, while the city was still wrapped in slumber, the Saviour, rising up a great while before day, went out and departed into a solitary place, and there prayed. End of quote. Wednesday, July 10, The Secret of Jesus' Ministry Read Mark 1, verses 35 to 39. What important lessons can be taken from what Jesus did here? Mark 1, beginning at verse 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, 
Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he travelled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Jesus arose before sunrise and went out to a quiet, deserted location to pray. Mark one thirty five emphasises prayer as the focus of Jesus' action. All the other verbal forms in the sentence are in summary form. He got up, went out, and departed. All in the aorist tense in Greek, signifying completeness. But the verb to pray is in the imperfect tense, a form used to express particularly here an ongoing process. He was praying. He kept on praying. The text also emphasises how early it was when Jesus went out, implying that his time of prayer alone was extensive. Throughout the Gospels, we meet Jesus as a man of prayer. In Matthew fourteen twenty three, after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. And Mark six forty six. after leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. And then the whole of John 17 is Jesus praying for his disciples and praying for all the believers. This appears to be one of the key secrets in the power of Jesus' ministry. Read Luke 6 and verse 12. What does this teach about Jesus' prayer life? One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. Many Christians have set times for prayer. This practice is good and right, but it also can become a routine, almost something done by rote. One way to break out of a set mould is to change the time of prayer occasionally or to pray longer than usual at times. The point is not to lock yourself into some kind of formula that can never change. Peter and his companions did not accompany Jesus to the place of prayer. Perhaps they knew of the location because they did find him. Their note that everyone was looking for Jesus suggested that he follow up the exciting experience of the previous day with more healing and teaching. Surprisingly, Jesus demurs and points to a wider field of service to other locations. In Mark one thirty eight, he says, But he said to them, Let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. And so to finish today, if Jesus himself needed to spend so much time in prayer, what about ourselves? And how much time should we spend in prayer? What does Jesus' example say to us? Thursday, July 31. Can you keep a secret? Read Mark chapter 1, verses 40 to 45. What does this teach us about Jesus and how he related to the marginalized in society? Mark 1, beginning at verse 40. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go... Show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. 
Leprosy, as described in this passage and throughout the Old Testament as well, did not refer only to what is known today as Hansen's disease, bona fide leprosy. The biblical terminology would be better translated as a dreaded skin disease and could include other epidemic ailments as well. Hansen's disease may have come to the ancient Near East about the 3rd century BC. Hence, the leper referred to in this passage could well have had Hansen's disease, though we don't know for sure exactly what the man suffered from, only that it was bad. The leper places faith in Jesus that he can cleanse him. According to Leviticus 13, a leper was ritually unclean and had to avoid contact with others, as you read in Leviticus 13 verses 45 and 46. Anyone with such a defiling disease must wear torn clothes, let their hair be unkempt, cover the lower part of their face and cry out, unclean, unclean. As long as they have the disease, they remain unclean. They must live alone. They must live outside the camp. Jesus, however, is moved with compassion toward the man and touches him. We read in Mark one forty one. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. This action should have defiled Jesus until the evening when he would be required to bathe to become ritually pure again, as is instructed in Leviticus chapter 13, 14 and 15. But Mark is clear that Jesus' action of touching the sick man cleanses him of his leprosy. Thus, Jesus was not defiled by touching the man. Jesus sends the man to a priest with the instruction to offer the sacrifice Moses commanded for such cases in Leviticus chapter 14. Throughout the Gospel of Mark, Jesus stands as a defender and supporter of what Moses taught. As you read in Mark 7.10, For Moses said, Honour your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. And Mark 10, verses 3 and 4, What did Moses command you? He replied. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. And Mark 12, verse 26, Now about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the account of the burning bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob and Mark 12 verses 29 to 31. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. This view stands in sharp contrast to the religious leaders who, in the passages in Mark chapter 7, Mark 10 and Mark 12, are subverting the original tent of the teachings given through Moses. These details explain Jesus' command in Mark 1.44 to silence the man. If he were to tell of his cure by Jesus, it might prejudice the decision of the priest in bias against Jesus. But the cleansed leper does not seem to understand this, and in disobedience of Jesus' command, he spreads the news far and wide, making it impossible for Jesus to enter towns openly for his ministry. And so, to finish today, how can we be careful not to do things that could hamper the spread of the gospel, no matter how good our intentions? Friday, July 12. What picture of Jesus does Mark 1 present? Jesus has authority to call disciples, and they respond. He is holy in contrast to unclean spirits under Satan. A great battle is going on between good and evil, and Jesus has more power than the demons. 
Jesus has compassion for sick people and helps them, touching them when perhaps no one else would. And then we read from the Desire of Ages, page 255 and 256. Jesus, in the synagogue, spoke of the kingdom he had come to establish and of his mission to set free the captives of Satan. He was interrupted by a shriek of terror. A madman rushed forward from among the people, crying out, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. All was now confusion and alarm. The attention of the people was diverted from Christ, and his words were unheeded. This was Satan's purpose in leading his victim to the synagogue. But Jesus rebuked the demon, saying, Hold your peace and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and hurt him not. He who had conquered Satan in the wilderness of temptation was again brought face to face with his enemy. The demon exerted all his power to retain control of his victim. To lose ground here would be to give Jesus a victory. But the Saviour spoke with authority and set the captive free. End of quote. Meanwhile, our Lord carried on a busy ministry, moving from place to place, almost constantly in touch with many people. How did he maintain a calm and steady approach to ministry and to people? It was doubtless through his daily experience of prayer. Think about what might be a workable schedule for you in regard to time for prayer and study of the scriptures. Find what works for you and take that time to develop a peaceful spirit guided by the Spirit and the Word of God. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, talk in class about the question of prayer and why it is so important in the Christian life. What are some of the questions people have about the purpose and efficacy of prayer? Two, in class talk about cases in which it might be best at certain times not to say too much about our faith. When might that be the prudent thing to do? And yet, how can we do that without compromising our witness? And three, who are the lepers in your culture today? How could your church reach out and touch these individuals to bring the gospel to them? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Bewildered Shaman, Part 2 by Andrew McChesney Father rested for several days at the house of his daughter Divya in Nepal. He was exhausted from his jobs as construction worker and shaman. Father watched with interest when the Seventh-day Adventist pastor of Divya's church came to visit and brought several church members with him. He listened as they sang several songs about his daughter's new God, Jesus. Then the pastor opened a Bible and read Jesus' invitation. Come to me, all ye who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He read from Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 in the New King James Version. Father felt a yearning in his heart to know this God. He wanted rest. Then the pastor read John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Father's heart was touched. He had never heard of a God who had given his only Son to save humanity. He realised that there was no need for animal sacrifices because God sent his Son as the ultimate sacrifice for all time. After the pastor left, Father asked Divya for a Bible. He wanted to read those two verses for himself, but when he looked, he couldn't find them. Divya also couldn't find them, so she called the pastor. He showed how to find the verses. Father was delighted and he began to read the Bible daily. On Sabbath, he went to church with Divya and his wife, who had been cured of her mysterious illness after Divya prayed. 
Father didn't understand anything at church or in the Bible, but he took the Bible when he left mother with Divya and returned home to a neighbouring town a short time later. At home he resumed work as a shaman and construction worker during the day, and at night he read the Bible. As the months passed his desire to worship spirits vanished. He decided to leave the shaman profession. My life is different, he told the townspeople. I don't want to do these rituals. The townspeople were furious when they learnt that father had become a Christian. They accused him of betraying his ancestors. Father didn't mind. He was sure that he had found the one and only God. Today, father and mother are active Seventh-day Adventists. Father, whose full name is Krishna Lama, is 66 years old and a deacon. I used to think that my home was where my ancestors lived, he said. But now I feel like the church is my home. With Jesus, my future is bright. This mission story illustrates mission objective number two of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's I Will Go Strategic Plan to strengthen and diversify Adventist outreach among unreached and underreached people groups. For more information, you can go to IWillGo2020.org.